はい、ありがとうございます。失礼します。えー、っと、I'm going to quick speak Japanese a little bit, just so,、um, you know, everybody who's watching can, can know. えっ、ー、と、皆様、えー、おはようございます。えっ、ー、と、本日は24時間の、ハイブの24時間のライブイベントなので、えっ、ー、と、今回の、えっ、ー、と、今回の、えっ、ー、と、セッションは、えっ、ー、と、英語なんですけど、えっ、ー、と、えっ、ー、と、質問とかもあれば、えっ、ー、と、ぜひぜひ、えっ、ー、と、コメントにしていただいて、えっ、ー、と、翻訳できるので、ぜひぜひお願いします。よろしくお願いします。これから英語しますので、よろしくお願いします。OK! So,、um, sorry, from now on, we're going to be using English for the English、uh, session.、Um, good morning to Japan. Good evening in America.、Um, welcome to the Hive 24 hour live a thon.、Uh, my name is Gino Gordon. I'll be your moderator.、Um, I'll be hosting this session called Current State of Sports and Brand Activation.、Um, we have a great lineup today、uh, with some guys with、uh, unique backgrounds.、Um, and I'll give a, go through a quick introduction really quickly. First, we have the five time MLB All Star, four time Golden Glove, and current、uh, Oryx Buffalo, Adam Jones. Good to see Adam.、Um, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have two people that I actually work really, really closely with、um, the two founders of Red Phoenix Entertainment,、uh, Leif Rogers and David Noel.、Uh, so,、uh, Leif has, has about tw- over 20 years' experience doing business. International business in China and East, East Africa. And then David has, has around 10 years, 10 years of experience as an entre- entrepreneur and international business consultant. So,、um, together they started Red Phoenix Entertainment, where they help athletes, teams, and sports organizations build their brand in international markets. As for what we're talking about today, we'll be discussing how COVID has negatively affected the sports industry, but also created op- new opportunities to utilize digital media and, sponsorships and sponsorship. Um, so, actually, David has created a short presentation and ha- ha- <clears throat> to update us on what's been going on with COVID.、Um, and from now,、uh, I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint and、uh, let him take it away. All right, so please give me one second, guys. Oops. Probably should have left this. Okay, so obviously, it probably would have been better to have these pictures on there, but I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to David right here. All right. Thank you so much, Gino, for、uh, that introduction. And first and foremost, I just wanted to thank Hive for putting on this webinar. We've been really excited to,、uh, to be a part of it. And a huge shout out to Adam Jones for taking the time、uh, to be with us here. I know a lot of people are going to be really excited to hear from them. So I'll keep my part as short as possible.、Uh, but again, thank you very much for this opportunity. All right. So, really quickly, I'll just explain a bit about what Red Phoenix does and, and, and who we are as a company. And really, what we're focused on is launching global strategy for brands, teams, athletes, and entertainers. In other words, we've really、uh, become a bridge company to, to help connect American professional sports and entertainment with Asian markets. We do that in a few different ways. We help brands,、uh, entertainers, athletes, et cetera, plan and manage international growth strategies. We help them activate international social media in various markets in Asia. We source global endorsements and sponsorships, and we execute media, film, and event productions. Uh, really, what sets us apart from other companies is that we have proven experience, number one, in bridging international cultures. As, as Gina mentioned, Leif had spent over t-、uh, 15 years or so in China. I had extens- extensive experience in China as well. We've been quite active here in Japan over the last few years.、Um, we really pride ourselves on trying to build strong connections between global brands and talent. And、uh, most importantly, is our network of trusted service providers. And so, anybody who has done extensive international business knows that you can't do it alone and you really need local partners. And that's what we're all about. Okay, so、uh, just very quickly, a snapshot of some of the projects we've worked on.、Um, you know, we have worked with MVPs from across every major、uh, American sport. Um, again, we worked with brands, sports teams, 
pretty exciting thing lately is we've been doing quite a bit with esports and um, some national teams, such as the Chinese Olympic boxing team. Um, but again, you know, athletes, brands, and sports teams are all our clients, and we try to uh, to connect people from across sports. Let's go ahead. All right, and so really what I'd like to talk about today is, you know, how has COVID impacted sports in general? I think we can all agree that 2020 has been quite a, an interesting year, and it's been pretty difficult uh, in sports. Um, first and foremost is, is for sports fans. Um, you know, audiences up until, you know, very recently haven't been able to directly interact with teams. Um, for the most part, haven't been able to go into stadiums. Um, a pretty cool thing I saw in Japan recently is SoftBank Hawks actually subbed in robot fans, uh, which, which in America we thought was pretty cool, and I, I wish some of our sports leagues would do the same. But for the most part, audiences are really still uh, lacking that, that engagement. Teams have been taking quite a big hit. You know, no games has meant less visible, visible opportunities for sponsors. Um, of course, they haven't had the same kind of ticket sales, if at all, which has really impacted their bottom lines. Um, and so this loss of revenue has really left them in a tough place. Brands are left without a proven tool for connecting with their audiences. And as we all know, brands really like to take out sponsorships um, and kind of do traditional endorsements uh, and sponsorships with and around sports that rely on people kind of con congregating together. And without, you know, with COVID really disrupting the way that people are moving about, uh, it, it's put brands in a tight spot where they really need to figure out what the next step is. So what's the situation in global sports today? I'll, I'll give you just a very quick recap. Uh, Taiwan and Korea were actually the first to kind of kick, kick off professional sports this year, uh, back in the spring with baseball. Um, in Korea right now, there is a plan to have fans, but as of right now, I believe there still are no fans. Um, and when they do bring them in, they're looking at filling the stadiums at about 30% cap. Over in China with the CBA, they started up in June. Uh, it's been pretty cool to watch China. Um, you know, they've handled the COVID situation fairly well. And so now you're starting to see teams actually move across the country and play each other. Um, they're starting to limit the number of fans who can actually visit the games. And pretty cool, if you look on this, this picture on the left here, you'll actually see a big large screen TV where they've actually kind of injected fans into the stadium. And this is just as much for the players to really get that sense of a spectator sport as it is for anything. Um, big news here in the U.S. today, the MLB started, which we're all happy about, uh, but it, it's been quite a, quite a road to get there. Um, the NHL is set to start in the beginning of August. What's interesting about the NHL is they're actually skipping the rest of the regular season and going straight into the playoff qualifiers. Uh, all of those matches will be held up in Canada. So they're kind of doing this bubble model, which rolls into the NBA, actually. The NBA is practicing right now in Orlando. Um, they're in this, quote unquote, NBA bubble where they've really limited the interaction with the outside world in the attempt to really control COVID and make sure that nobody, nobody gets sick. Uh, the NFL, you know, they're kind of keeping quiet, but as far as we know, they're still in negotiations. They're moving towards the season. And as of right now, there won't be preseason. Uh, final point on this, what what I find pretty interesting is the, the difference between the U.S. and Asia and how and when sports have started up. You know, obviously the U.S. hasn't been the best with handling the coronavirus. And so we've really had to adopt kind of this bubble model where, you know, we, we seclude the teams and the players. Uh, and we'll, we'll see how that works out. But it's been encouraging to watch places like Japan and China and Korea really get their leagues up and running. Okay. Quick snapshot of Japan sports. So as we all know, uh, MPV is back and playing. Uh, there's been a limited amount of, of fans allowed into the stadiums. The J League also had started last month, I believe, with limited fans. Sumo is back in action. Again, they're limiting the amount of fans who are allowed in. Uh, as, as far as I know, uh, X League, you know, football and basketball are not playing quite yet, but we're, we're hoping that they do come back. 
And across Japan, it's been pretty standard to, number one, limit the amount of fans who are allowed in, into the arenas. Uh, number two, to require face masks. And number three, to do some sort of screener or check on fans before they come into the stadium. All right. So how are athletes engaging with fans and brands now? Well, you know, athletes are, are just like us and, and they're, they're socially distancing as well. As well. Um, primarily, if they're not practicing and playing, they're staying home with their families. And this has created kind of a unique, a unique opportunity for athletes to start branching out and leveraging technology to reach their core audiences, to engage with brands. Um, and so we, we've seen some pretty exciting movement in this space. In esports, you've got guys like Trevor May from the MLB, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster from the NFL, who are very active playing video games and streaming across Twitch and YouTube and picking up endorsements, et cetera. Um, webinars and podcasts, actually, Adam, who's with us here tonight, launched a podcast where they speak about sports, social issues, uh, other pressing topics. A really good opportunity to again connect with fans in, in kind of this new digital age. Uh, Mark Ingram from the NFL is another example. Uh, he's actually partnered up with the NFL Players Association and they're doing uh, virtual workouts from home. And it's a really cool opportunity for fans to see how an NFL player works out. Um, social media Rui Hachimura recently did a Twitter stream bilingually. Uh, speaking to both American and Japanese audiences. You've got guys like Mookie Betts, who just landed a huge contract, by the way, uh, in, with the MLB. But right before the Korean baseball season started up, he did a big outreach campaign where he was basically praising different players from the various Korean teams, uh, speaking in Korean and just celebrating Korean culture. And so, again, this has been kind of a cool opportunity to see athletes push beyond uh, what they traditionally might be doing in a non-COVID world. So that really brings us into what is the opportunity? We know that things are shaken up, right? Mm -hmm. Audiences are dying for sports content. They're dying for anything that they can really engage with. Uh, brands desperately need to reach new audiences. And athletes are more willing uh, to, again, use and leverage virtual and, and technology to actually reach to these audiences. So what we see is this is actually a huge opportunity uh, for brands to start working with athletes and harnessing the power of technology, harnessing the power of digital platforms to actually start reaching their audiences in new ways. Uh, quick snapshot. So in the past, you know, when you think about sponsorship endorsements, a lot of people think of somebody's face plastered on a big billboard, you know, in a major city. And the reason for that is um, when you can't target your, your customer base uh, completely, you go for the biggest, most famous athlete you can think of and hope that enough people see that billboard. Those type of sponsorships are usually a year plus in length. They can cost quite a bit of money. They're usually pretty big in scope. But with, again, with the COVID situation, those type of endorsements are not as relevant anymore. And we're starting to see more of these kind of short-term, nimble, virtual endorsements. Maybe an athlete is actually filming himself or herself from the home, from their own home. Uh, maybe they're doing a workout program, whatever it might be. Uh, and it's oftentimes distributed through social media. Uh, that's another great thing right now. Is social media enables us to really micro-target followers. And so you don't necessarily need a big billboard anymore. You can really hone in on who your audience is. Uh, the ROI for brands is a lot more measurable now because you can measure it from social engagement, number of clicks, number of sales, et cetera. And consequently, this has actually led uh, to lower price points across the board. So right now it's, it's a, an amazing time to brand leverage sports market. And I'll wrap up um, my part of the presentation by just giving out a few examples of this. So Juju Smith-Schuster, who I mentioned before, recently did a, a, an endorsement with Castrol uh, Motor Oil, where he's actually working out in his garage. Uh, this is, was being streamed over YouTube and over um, Instagram. A uh, really cool one, this picture in the middle is actually Walmart and LeBron James and, and a host of other celebrities teamed up to provide uh, virtual summer camps. And so, 
you know, at least in the U.S., summer camp is a big thing. It's a big rite of passage for, for American children during the summertime. And with COVID, you can't go to summer camp anymore. So what Walmart has provided is this virtual summer camp. And LeBron James is actually uh, one of the camp counselors, and he's leading the kids in athletic programs and arts and crafts, et cetera. And it's a very unique, creative way uh, to engage with an audience. Finally, uh, Adrian Peterson from the NFL has been quite active with um, some startups. He does a, a weekly giveaway. Uh, this is one example of some sleep. And really why this is a good example is because it shows that somebody who's even MVP caliber is working with smaller startup brands and helping them to reach their core audiences through uh, virtual means. And of course, there, there's a there's a host of other examples as well. But, uh, you know, in, in short, what what we see here is this is a golden opportunity for brands globally to engage with their fans, engage with their core audiences using sports. And maybe this is a better time for brands like in Japan to engage with American sports and entertainment than ever before. Again, because of those typically those, those lower price points and more importantly, because of the accessibility and the use of technology. And that is all I have for today. But uh, if anybody has further questions, you know, please follow uh, Adam Jones, who we'll, we'll hear from in a bit um, on his on his social media platforms. And if you'd like to connect with us, please reach out. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we'll take turn this off and so, um, yeah, we'd actually like to open up the floor a little bit. Um, I could see there's already a plethora of questions <laughs> uh, coming through, but um, well, really quickly, let's um, let's 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 turn to Adam really quickly. And obviously, um, we've talked a little bit about how people, how athletes, professional athletes, are directly uh, reaching out to uh, or directly connecting with. Uh, with fans kind of through digital media. And you obviously have, um, you've been pretty outspoken on various civil rights movements and, and stuff like that. But then also you have this podcast where you're actually able to directly um, do something like that. So what's your motivation for doing that? What was this purpose? You know, can you give a little bit of a background on that? Well, I think going on, like what's going on in the entire world right now, it just, um, I think a lot of people want to hear from the athletes, obviously, um, the, the union speaks for us in, mo in the majority of, of the conversations because players don't want to, um, I guess, come off in any sort of way to the fans, at the, especially right now, because, you know, a lot of people are unemployed with the 40 million. If not, I don't even, I don't even really know the accurate number, but in that range of unemployment, you know, you don't want to hear about, you know, athletes. We're not able to play when obviously majority, a lot of them have uh, financial stability and um so you don't want they don't want to come off as being brash or cocky or not caring about society and my podcast is more just like look it there's a like you think of the mike trouts the mookie Betts, uh you think of all those guys in major league baseball and then obviously the lebrons and then the nfl guys that you know every athlete's just loaded and swimming in cash when the actual truth is um you know you got 2500 major league baseball minor league baseball players that aren't getting paid this year um, or they end up getting paid but it's 400 bucks a, a week unemployment makes more than that so you think you think that other players are going to come back because they're getting more in unemployment what if they're in low a high a to where they're like you know i'm, I'm making more money doing this and you know it might be time to delve off into a real career because making major leagues might not be a foreseeable goal especially with the cutting of 42 minor league teams so me personally i just wanted to give uh, fans an opportunity to understand um, what it's really like to be an athlete. I've been successful, but I, at the same time, I know 50 people that have not in my shoes, 50 people that have sacrificed the same things I've sacrificed, but have not able been able to capitalize monetarily on it. So, you know, just trying to give the athletes perspective because everybody, you know, there's that saying, you know, the spoiled millionaires and all that. And I'm like, you know, the truth is the majority of players are not, millionaires the majority of players are not getting those big lucrative deals the majority of the players are uh grinding away even if you know if they can play 15 years of professional ball they might get three at the top of, at the highest level but people don't really see that they just see you know uh the average salary is four and a half million in major league baseball well if you count the 30 guys making 30 million 
Of course, it's going to drive the number up. But if you look at the guys that are just continually grinding at the bottom, um, you know, you see a you see a big difference. And I just try to get a unique perspective into into the life of a of a baseball player because I can't talk about the NFL or the NBA or hockey or tennis because I don't particularly know them. But um, just try to give them a unique perspective of how baseball is. And I've, I've had some guests on that explained it, and you know. People still don't want to listen to because they want their own. They always want to control the narrative and, and certain things. But just try, you know, throw some truth on, throw some truth into the matter. And that, uh, you know, not all athletes are rich. Some are, but most, the majority of them are not. As we all know, we all got athlete friends. Yeah, that's that's a really that's a really good point. So you're you're really giving them a clear view of what it's like to be an athlete. And I think. Um, that's 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 the biggest thing with fans and everything. You don't really necessarily understand. Um, you see the lights. You see kind of everything that's going around football, or sorry, I was football player around the sport. Um, but you don't necessarily see all the things going on and kind of in the dark or that when the, the lights are off. And people think about training, but also there's there's the thing about making a living for yourself. So that's a really good point. Um, looks like we got a fan that just came out and said hi. <laughs> right here, you see on the bottom. Good morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But um, but yeah, that's that's actually a really good point. So you're really giving kind of like that that uh, that kind of raw view of everything, and I think that that yeah, is. I'm really not sugarcoating. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying not to sugarcoat. I think right now, people are tired of the the uh, conventional answers. So I'm just trying to not sugarcoat anything. Like this is how it is. You guys don't like it. I mean, it's, we're athletes. It's a very very hard job. People can do your job. It's not a. I mean, there's a lot of jobs that in the world that are not that hard to do sorry to say mm-hmm. and you know people jump on the athletes because we're not playing and you know i read all like, i got so many friends with the mlb pa and you know i like reading the comments just to see the temperature of the fans because the fans are the most important thing going on with the game they, they're our supporters they are obviously you know they're the people that you go out there and play for you want to hear the <clears throat> You want to hear the cheers. You want to hear the roar of the crowd. If it's good or bad, you want that energy. Fans bring you energy. And, you know, like if you're in Japan, we got the fans back. And you can just clearly see the night and day difference. The first uh, three weeks without fans, it's just like playing in a morgue, you know. And now you got some fans, you got some reaction. So it's it's like it's fulfilling. Obviously, they're not as loud. They can't be as uh, rambunctious as I've heard in the past because – of the social distancing because they don't want people moving up and down, but mm-hmm. um, it, it's it's good to have a crowd. It's good to hear people yeah. cheering. It's good to hear some clapping. Yeah. Well, here we actually got a question specifically about the fans. Um, I'm going to show you right here. So, please tell us if you have any impressive episodes from interacting with Japanese fan. Obviously, I think to give you a little bit more context, I think you know, but to give a little bit more context, I think. Um, one thing that's legendary about Japan sports is their fans. So if you look at the World Cups or any of these type of things, you see like the fans are extremely, uh, extremely, uh, I would say just nice. You know, see them cleaning up the stadium. Um, and I've had some experience as well of being able to just say, oh, like, oh, these guys are actually nice to me. I've gotten these wonderful, like, handwritten notes uh, when I was playing uh, as a professional athlete. So have you had any episodes like that where you, um, you had some, oh, this is, you know, great experience type of moments? Uh, when I first got here, we first got to Miyazaki. It's, uh, it was probably two weeks before we ended up meeting. And um, so walking into the ballpark every morning and there's fans there. And what was great is like they all had like little gifts and the majority of them were like chocolates. Mm-hmm. And I love me, me and my interpreter was like, <laughs> yeah, let's, 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 let, let's take a picture. Let's hug them. This is all before the COVID broke out. So I'm glad I didn't, I'm glad I didn't uh, contract anything, but <laughs> um, my experience so far have just been have been great. Everybody's been really nice. They've been welcoming, saying thank you for coming over here and uh, you know support. Obviously, they want um, you know they want you to uh, you know fight. That's how they say fight. Fight yeah. They want you to you know win 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 today. You know is is kind of their motto, and it's everything's been good. The people have been very positive. I've got a lot of messages on social media about you know. Thank you for for coming here. But, you know, help Oryx win, and you know the organization has been great in that regards, also. So, you know, I just want to see, um, I just want to see that full capacity. I think mm. like, I've gotten the first game against SoftBank in spring training, like sold out crowd. You've seen everything go crazy, and then the next day everything went dark. So, 
Um, I just want to get get back to normalities and mm-hmm. and experience the, the full effect of of the fans here and the full effects of all the cities opening and the full effect of what uh, the NPB and what Japan has to offer. Because yeah. it's from what I heard from from uh, friends that have played here for so long, it's it's remarkable. Yeah, it it really is. It really is a remarkable thing to see. I've had I went to a few games in the Tokyo Dome and. There's there's nothing like seeing kind of like the the fervent fans um, with each of their songs and you know they're very they little mm-hmm. quirks in terms of and it's it's a really amazing thing to see um, so yeah hopefully as you know as things kind of progress uh, you know you'll be able to see that there's actually one it's funny how you kind of talked about the stadium a little bit but there's one question right here how do you feel about the difference between MPB ballparks and the MLB ones from the standpoint of a player oh night and day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh no, nah, man! I, every time we walk into a real ballpark, I text my wife and I'm like, "I don't know if I can do this. I don't know. <laughs> the, the accommodations aren't the same." I was like, "This is like, it's like, ah, it's not the same." But I came here, so I'm I'm embracing it. You know, I'm like, this is reverting all the way back to like high A double A ball. These locker rooms, I can't really do it. <laughs> but you know, I'm here, and I'm like, you know, I'm, my wife's like, well, you can go home and sit on the couch. And I'm like, oh, here you go, Debbie Downer over here. But you know, she's true. She's she's honest. I, you know, I, my opportunities in the states were limited, so you know, take it take it for what it's worth, and uh, and just embr- I'm I'm just trying to embrace everything. Everything I'm seeing is for the first time. Every new ballpark is for the first time. Every pitcher I'm facing is for the first time. So you know, it's it's basically taking me back to uh you know my rookie year you know just embrace everything that's embrace the change embrace everything that's coming your way you know it's easy to be like well i played the major leagues for all these years and you know this is how we did it there well not in the major leagues you know you walk out in the stadium english is not being spoken english is not on the on the billboards you know so just embrace everything that's coming my way and you know i think by having that mindset um has has really helped me do it and if I, i've had some friends again like i said have just told me this is things to expect these are you know the temperature and and how they handle business here a different mm-hmm. style of a, a different style of baseball so just embrace everything it's not going to be the same as what you've seen it's not waiting for the three run home run it's you know plan for the one run that inning it's just a style is completely different so just embrace it and by by said again by having that mindset it's made everything uh, it's made everything easier because it's easy to complain. It's, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes you just want to go, oh, well, they don't do this. And I want to wish that we did this. It's like, I'm not the manager. I'm not the style. They've been playing this game for a long time over here. And I'm just here to help and enjoy it and mm-hmm. eat a lot of food. <laughs> well, it's two things. Hey, Japan has great food, by far one of the best. Um, but that's, oh, that's a really good point that you said. You know, it's kind of that adaptability. And, and that's something that, I feel like is extremely important, especially when you're in Japan. It's like being adaptable to be able to say, "Hey, like this is not, this is not. I'm not. I'm coming from a different area. I need to be able to know when to push, when not to push." And and that's kind of like that a little bit. Um, that's that understanding the culture, but then also just being able to be adaptable. And actually, I'm going to bring this over uh, onto the business side because this is actually a very good segue. Um, Leif, actually, I have a. There's one question for you. Um, Obviously, you've had a lot of experience in, in in kind of international business, especially in China. So, um, can you talk a little bit about kind of um, what are some of like the cultural obstacles in terms of maybe legal or business that you have run into in your experience? Yeah, sure. Um, so many of the deals that Red Phoenix and our when we first began were just business or endorsement or sponsorships that failed from the two sides communicating. It's a big problem. It's it's odd for someone that you know grew up overseas that we're such a global and connected world that they, these problems are so prevalent and existed and such in the forefront. But it's a great thing because that's why my company exists. Um, <laughs> It, it, it can be, and a lot of it I blame on the American side. Um, they tend to lump Asia in a group um, when every country is different, but it, there's also expectations and, and, and it's more of an innocence from the Asian brands or the Asian sponsors that 
that this is their first time working with a, a, a high caliber athlete. And, you know, of course they want the most out of it. And so this is where we try to step in. And again, and a lot of our first deals were where uh, an endorsement or a, a commercial or whatever it is that completely collapsed. And we step in and manage both the expectations from both sides and help bridge those two. On what's perfect about my partner David is I grew up in uh, East Africa, as you mentioned, then Papua New Guinea, and then pretty much spent my whole working life in Asia. I tend to lean much heavier for the Asian brands, uh, the American legal system, and how, how it just drives me nuts. The fact that you can't get on the phone and call somebody here, and you know it's just email, email. I know these are pain points for Asian brands. Um, and so I tend to lean heavy and protective on the Asian side, and David's really good. On, on the American side, balancing that out. So uh, it, it's it's sad that that exists, but it's why our company exists. And uh, we try to manage the, we always say the nonsense from both sides. Exactly. And, and yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's really, I think uh, to everybody's point a little bit is that, you know, it's not necessarily just the business aspect, but the culture, kind of the internal culture behind it is what causes some of these frictions. And you can see it kind of manifest itself on the baseball side, you can see it manifest itself on the you know on the on the, the the business side as well. So, being able to find companies that's able to kind of be that intermediary, um, I think, is really important. And like I said, uh, adaptability is key. Yeah, and Adam clearly gets it. I mean, he just said that he didn't come over here and say, "Hey, this isn't how you do it," and are trying to change the system or whatever. He he respects their history of the game and how they play it, and is trying to do his part. And that's what. I feel more American brands, teams, and, and, and companies should do as well. Exactly. Uh, so it looks like uh, we got one question for you, uh, Adam. Let's see. I'll post it up right here. How has COVID been affecting your life training in Japan so far? What made you decide to play in the MPB? That's a pretty bad question. So I'll, I'll, leave, I'll let you yeah. handle that one. Um, <laughs> well, I can start by saying well, the, the latter question is uh, what made me decide to play for MVP is um, – well, last going into the off season of 2018, um, I didn't really have any offers. I didn't end up signing until March 13th of 19, where the teams were three weeks away from opening day, and uh, you know I was sitting at home training, but uh, with no job. So um, this all the, as the season progressed, you know I was talking to my agent about just possibilities. You never know what what life happens. How many years do I want to play? And then once the off season happened. Um, Oryx reached out and I was like, you know, this is the first time and, and some athletes get to get to do this is to control their own narrative and control their own career. You know, I've had plenty of friends. I'm sure we, we all have friends in the industries that have had had to just go away, you know, right off in the sunset, not necessarily on their own terms. Not everybody's going to have the, the, you know, the, the Kobe RIP, his kind of, you know, the, those kind of farewells, the David Ortiz farewells, the CC Sabathia farewells, that just don't happen. You know, the Peyton Manning farewells, that, those, that, those are so few and far in between. So I was just like, you know what, this is the first time I can control my career. I can control anything about what I want to do. If I want to retire, I can retire. If I want to go play, I can go play. And it's not like it's as though it's not chasing money. This is chasing opportunity, chasing experience. And when I came over here, like my, me and my wife, she was like, let's go let's get out of here because i said she lived in paris as a kid for a couple of years so having that international experience is just marvelous and then for our boys it, it makes it made total sense to where it's like you know it's not just about me and my career anymore it's more about the experiences i can give to my family my friends obviously with you know and then the, the COVID stuff it's halted in terms of uh, my parents my family being able to come out here friends once they see me signed over here are like hey we're going to japan because we want to see you play. And then it's like an like a opportunity to go see a whole brand new culture, a brand new country. And, um, but I think uh, the COVID stuff, I think it's just really, it, it halted the game. It's, you know, obviously we started mid June, but I think right now over here in Japan, it's everything, while everything is opened back up, it's been great. You know, been able to go out and get some food, uh, tour Osaka a little bit. Obviously on the road, we're a little bit, um, uh, restricted on what we can do because they want to just you know limit our activities outside but in osaka we're able to go out found this be great mexican restaurant uh been i haven't pressed any sushi yet which is kind of like 
weird, um, <laughs> but I've got I've gotten some really high end recommendations. And when we get back to Osaka after this road trip, we got a couple of days off, so I'm I'm gonna dip on some sushi. But you know, right now we're in uh, Sendai where they say the seafood's great, and then we go to Sapporo where they say the seafood's great. So I might have to bend the rules a little bit and uh, go get myself some sushi. <laughs> yeah yeah you, you should probably do that um and i guess at the end of the day you're not going to go wrong in sushi anywhere in japan i, I feel as though um because i even no yeah i've had some hole in the wall places and, and it's been great some of the best i've ever had so um when you get back to when you get back to tokyo i'll definitely take you to some, some spots as well um hey there's way hey, actually i had a really interesting question that just came up adam for just for you so i'll i'll, I'll bring it up right here I heard you love donuts. Mm. <laughs> I would like your opinion on Mr. Donuts in Japan. I'm not sure if you, you've uh, you've had it before yet, but it's a pretty popular kind of donut chain. And then whether or not you have been in contact with them for a for a brand deal. Um, um, I've tried them. I don't want to give my opinion unless until they like completely X. <laughs> Uh, if a deal is possible, <laughs> I don't want to say anything that. Uh, <laughs> that'll get me in trouble. Or, or, <laughs> if they want to do a deal, hey, donut is marvelous. <laughs> Please, hey, if there's I've, a, I've had there's it one. A... I've had it one time in Miyazaki. Yeah, oh, okay. um, yeah, but I, they're not. They're not. I mean, they're not so big on donuts out here. In every other corner in the states, you get a Dunkin' or a, uh, you know local donuts or whatever. Yum yums in San Diego. Uh, oh, Randy's yeah. in LA. Yeah, I know uh, Shipley's in Dallas. <laughs> so you know, you know, you know, I know the donut places across the United States. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Uh, Dave, actually, I got one question for you. Um, actually, let me just go ahead and find it. Okay, so like, there's actually it's going back a little bit to the kind of the Red Phoenix model, and um, one of the problems that you really guys you guys do solve is kind of getting access to these global athletes. I think that's one thing in Japan where it, the the market itself is very insular and there's it's actually really difficult to, there, there's definitely a wall in between where it's hard to get in and it's hard to get out. So um, obviously with your guys' experience in China doing these type of cross-border cross border, um, cross border deals, um, how do you kind of solve these problems of accessing these global athletes for domestic brands? And I think that's something, you know, brands in Japan would love to know about kind of, yeah. You know. That's a great question. I mean, first of all, I mean, you heard from Adam himself. I mean, the, the share of these kind of big sponsorships and endorsements are, are kind of going towards some of, some of the, the most famous athletes. And there's a lot of guys and, and women out there who have huge brands themselves who have really dedicated followers and they're not necessarily getting all of the requests um, from brands. And I think that that's kind of, there's two parts to that. I think one, brands don't really, to your point, know how to access athletes or even how to approach it, especially if they're international. The second part is, um, you know, I, I'm not here to, to speak ill about you know, about agents by any means, but the, the traditional model is you kind of pursue what, what has the highest price tag and then you don't really focus um, as much on, on on the rest. And so what we've really tried to do is, is two things. One, we've really tried to focus on bringing opportunities to all types of athletes because, again, there's so much brand value um, to anybody who's playing professionally. Um in terms of getting access, it's it's not as hard as you think. Um, I think the challenge for maybe a Japanese brand or, or any brand is how do you communicate what you're actually asking for, right? How do you really know what it is that, that you want? Do you first understand who your target market is and, and what you're trying to do? And if you know that, or if somebody can help you figure that out, then it's easy to then bring it to an agency or, or to a player directly or, or whatever whatever it might be. Um, that's really where we, we've added a lot of values, helping to kind of translate um, literally and figuratively what the needs are back and forth on both sides and really help to build that bridge so that deals can happen. So mm -hmm. um, I guess what I would say is that brands can access athletes, um, just know what you want or at least have an idea and don't be afraid to, to pursue it. And I think there are a lot of people out there who would love to take part in, in endorsing products and services. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, 
Actually, so I have one follow up question to Leif, and kind of in a similar vein. I think I think it's a common notion, um, especially see like the athletes are particularly are are really out of every every brand's budget. And obviously, David mentioned this a little bit before. So, um, what are your thoughts on the fact that on the idea that like most pro athletes are actually too expensive to actually get a hold of? Can you uh, kind of go into that a little bit? Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah. they can be expensive. I mean, we all hear about the, you know, Federer, Uniqlo and these huge deals. And it, it kind of just takes all those, you know, non-Coca-Cola, Nike and any brand that's a tier two and just, well, we can't access that or afford that and walk away. And it also follows to David's point, that traditional model of contacting Gensu, who then contacts the agency, the CAA or whatever it is, and Wasserman or in, in the U.S., everybody's adding their price point and the agency in America is saying, well, you know, Adam's not going to work for any less than 3 million on anything. And the phone gets hung up. And so we really try to, from the beginning, we've tried to go directly to the athlete. And um, there's not a lot of companies out there that are bringing Asian deals. So we kind of were able to establish that uh, connectivity and a reputation fairly quickly. And so we became a value add to the agencies here and they would at least listen. As this has progressed, um, athletes themselves, half the time they don't ever get to hear about what the, um, you know, what the proposal is, and, you know, if their agent doesn't. So we try to eliminate all that and get, find the athlete that fits the brand the best uh, it's what they want, and we know will work well with whatever that format is and go directly to the athlete or the agent and say, this is a way of expanding your brand globally, et cetera. The points that David brought up about COVID and how this has accelerated, that transition was happening anyway. The big billboards and all that, they're just not cost effective and brands want a better ROI. They want better results. They want to target demographics. And for example, we were talking to a drink brand this afternoon that we presented some tier one athletes and they were, they're a startup and they're like, no, we want, we want more accessible kind of tier two, tier three levels because they're going to do more for our brand. And we're able to target, target, you know, through what the sport is a specific demographic. So we try to fit that. And, and then, you know, the accessibility is so huge. I mean, I grew, Adam Jones is one of the best baseball players of my lifetime. I watched him with the Mariners. I saw him, you know, become a five-time all-star in Baltimore. And, you know, how many of us thought that we would be sitting here today, um, you know, on a Japanese webinar talking to Adam Jones? And so Japanese brands need to take advantage of that accessibility while they can. And, and because it might not happen next year or the year after that. Also, if I was talking to an American brand, on behalf of Adam, he's much more valuable now than he was when he was in Baltimore because he's now a global brand accessing Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and all of that fan base in America. And you should be using him right now. And that's where the way I'd appeal to both sides. Exactly. So Mr. Donut, we're waiting yeah. on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's coffee. It does yeah. coffee. We're waiting on you. Uh, Okay, that's th thank you, thanks, Leif. That was a really, really, really great answer. I'm, I'm glad this is see these are these are great things because we're getting so many different perspectives, kind of on the business side, on the player side, especially when it comes to branding. It, it's huge, especially like a guy like Adam or who's playing it, who's play had experience of being doing really well in both leagues, and now you have kind of like that. You become that global athlete, and to be quite frank, there's really not too many of those, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, being able to to do that is is huge. Um, actually, there was one question for you, uh, Adam, a little bit more about yourself. So where do you see yourself in five years? A five-year question. Ooh, there's always that, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's what you, um, I, I, I got I, I know my body has a couple years left, maybe not five. Um, but I'm gonna try and push it and play as long as I can. I have a third year option. Um, but I sit in five years, hopefully I'm coaching my kids and uh maybe managing back in the big leagues you know for some reason the last couple of years i i was like uh, bullish on the fact that you know i don't really want to manage i don't know but i, I don't know there's something I, I i have i got too much information in, in my brain and strategy and i, I want to manage that so capacity um in the major leagues not necessarily probably not over here but in the major leagues i would like to uh 
dibble and dabble at, at the managing. But at the same time, I want to play out here and I want to travel. I haven't had a summer off since I was probably 11 years old. So my wife is uh, adamant about when you're done, we're gone. We're seeing the whole world. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm gonna, I want to give her that that opportunity to just see everything that we can see, especially in the summertime. You see all your friends and obviously not this year, but majority of the time, the 4th of July and Memorial Days and the, the whole summer there on a boat somewhere and I'm on the field sweating, hot in the uniform. So I <laughs> want to be on the you, boat. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, wanna, I wanna be on that boat. I wanna jump in the lake and stuff like that. And um, you know, just live, really. You know, I've baseball's consumed so much of my life. Uh, even in the off season it consumes. I have to make sure that my workouts are in order before I even plan a trip. So uh, just be able to be free from everything and just live, travel. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, you've been doing it for so long at such a high level. You mm-hmm. got to be able to eventually just say, "Hey, I I need some time to exactly. to to be me and yeah, figure out who who I am." So, but that, that, that is that is that's a good dream. That's also a good dream to have, though, in terms of not dream but goal to have for um, being a manager. Obviously, seeing um, more individuals like yourself in management would be a welcome sight. You know, big so, time. I, yeah. I mean, to be a GM, be assistant to the GM. Have some sort of power. Have some sort of pull. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Be able to be able to control some sort of narrative, um, and you know, add my expertise. You know, I've I've done it for a while. I've seen it, you know, and and then I, but but really learn, learn the philosophies. Learn, you know, as a player, you're just like, well, I'm good. I want to play hard. I want to win. I want to do X, Y, Z. But as, on the front office side of it, they have a completely different philosophy, and I want to learn. Uh, I want to learn what they're thinking. You know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And that and that that brings it, you know, to another side of kind of like the business of the sport. So, yeah, um, that's that is really interesting. Uh, let's see if they have a couple other questions. I think there's some there's a few things that probably they want to know about uh, you, Adam, in terms of what, what's been going on with COVID. What's the what's been the situation um, at Odix uh, uh, about kind of like COVID? How are they managing you guys? What are some of the precautions that they're taking? Um, well, we just had our second test. We should have the results back. And if if they haven't knocked on your door or took you on the side, I'm assuming that you don't have it. So uh, they've been temperature checking us every day when we enter the ballpark on the home and road. Um, you know, they've, they've restricted us going out um, on the hotels. They don't want us going out to different eateries or anything like that. Um, we can go out for walks, nice long walks around the city. Who wants to do that? Uh, you know, you want to go to a restaurant or a bar or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Just go a long walk, but uh, they just encourage you to wear your mask. And uh, I think they got a the real, really under control. It, it's just, you know, just you just can't venture out so much. And I, mm. I understand the rules, so I'm just trying to follow the rules and do my part. Pretty much, I'm not trying to be a problem with it. I'm just trying to do my part. Oh, well, of course, that definitely, that definitely makes sense. Um, so is there, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the MLB and what kind of what they're doing in terms of COVID. Are there any major differences or have you heard of any, any major differences? Say it one more time. Uh, like how the MLB is actually handling COVID and, and David, you can actually chime in if you want as well, or David, if you can chime in as well, like how MLB and the MPB, the differences in how they're uh, kind of handling COVID. Do you, have you heard anything from kind of your friends in there um, about, you know, any major um, differences? They, I mean, one of my good friends is one of the clubhouse guys in Baltimore, and he's just saying, like, the, the social distancing, everything is weird. There's, you know, a clubhouse that's usually fit for 45 guys. You got 12 guys there. Umpires rooms are being used. Visitors are being used. It's just everybody's spread out. Um, they have one of the best chefs I've ever had in my life in any kind of thing, and she's not able to cook in the in the facility. She has to make it somewhere else and then bring it in into go boxes um it's just they they've really adapted to social distancing like to the max and obviously with them starting uh, you know an hour ago i think that it's a good sign that they're back because <clears throat> summer you need you, summers summers for baseball so we only get uh we only get three months of of uninterrupted other sports because basketball playoffs take off the first two months of the season and then September, you get the football rolling in, so people really don't care so much about baseball. But we get June, July, and August, so we're really trying to uh, really trying to maximize that. And it's great that it's back, but it's 
I think how MPB's handling is a little bit different than MLB. Obviously, MLB is a, a much bigger business. You know, they're talking about $10 billion uh, business. So, you know, I just think that, you know, talking to my friends, they're glad to be back. And, and you know, the thing is, is, is health. You know, a lot of mm-hmm. people have young kids at home, have, uh, you know, elderly parents or aunties, grandparents who are still alive. And they're just trying to make sure that they keep them, not just themselves uh, safe because, say, we're athletes. We're in our 20s and 30s. We think that we're invincible, but it's not about us. It's about people who aren't as invincible, people who have. Like, I wouldn't want to be around my mom right now. I love her. I really do, but I don't because of certain underlying health issues. Um, I wouldn't be around my mother-in-law or my father-in-law or older aunties because, you know, something some, something simple can turn into something big for them. So. I just think that, you know, like with the NBA zone with the bubble, it's it's going to be tough for athletes to sit in one spot for a long time. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, if you're doing your part, uh, it, it, hopefully it could all uh, go away and we could just have a better uh, better 2021, hopefully. <laughs> <I'm trying laughs> <to get at. laughs> yeah, you can definitely want to, yeah, redo 2020 if we could. Um, definitely. It looks like we got one other question that came in just for you, Adam. Um, it said... You go, AJ, what's the good athlete role model you think? So any type of, do you have any, you know, we can open this up a little bit, not just to baseball. Do you have any role models, you know, know, like who is someone that you look up to and kind of why and how? Um, What am I, I mean, obviously growing up, Tony Gwynn was my role model because of baseball, my love for the game. Uh, Mark McLemore has been my mentor throughout uh, my whole entire career. He's just led me in the right path in terms of when it, what a real, what a career can look like, uh, the family aspect, the financial aspect, off the field, handling family, friends, handling associates, handling the fans, um, just life in general. And, um, you know, I think for athletes, you, you have a unique platform, especially in today's era with social media. A lot of things that you say, if you, especially if you have the social media, that's why I like Kawhi. He got no social media, so nothing he says can get mis- you know, misconstrued or nitpicked at. But for the majority of athletes that have social media, you know, use the platform in a good way. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes you get angry. Don't post that stuff on social media because <laughs> it's never it's never a good sight when you see you know an angry athlete posting, you know, dang this and dang that, cussing out the fans or anything like that because the fans are the fans are a big part of the social media experience and. You have to take the good with the bad. So I just think that athletes have a unique platform and not just athletes, you know, businessmen, people who are people who um, have the opportunity to impact others. And, you know, like like I said, like David and in, in life have the opportunity to impact others also. So even if they have views in certain ways, it's definitely not the best place to go in social media and go on these rants as you see. You know, with certain athletes right now, the retired or current that, you know, getting these Twitter arguments, you never, you, you, was it, you can't cure stupid. That's, that's, the, was that one of the saying? <laughs> yeah, I understand. So it looks like we got, I think we have time for one more question. This is actually uh, for you, David and Leif. Um, it's like, question for David and Leif. What are the opportunities you see for Taiwan specifically right now? I feel that Taiwan market is overlooked. Great country. I lived there for 10 years and know that they're fully open. So, um, what, you know, whoever wants to go to take that one, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll yeah. take the first shot. I mean, yeah, yeah. I love Taiwan myself. I mean, it's so Leif and I have, have had less interaction uh, in Taiwan, but obviously it's a market that we're definitely focused on. Um, You know, a lot of people think about baseball when they think about Taiwan, but there's all kinds of opportunity from uh, extreme sports, you know, skateboarding, BMX. Actually, when we were there last, we visited uh, a racetrack um, and learned a little bit more about how many racing fans, professional racing fans there are in the country. Um, But, you know, for some reason, the professional sport just hasn't taken off to its full potential. Um, I, I think Taiwan's a huge potential market, and I agree it is overlooked. Um, so I don't, I don't have a good answer for why, uh, more, I guess, sports aren't actively going there, but I, I definitely agree that they should. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm all for it. 
Yeah, and I'd just add that from athletes that go, you know, on these tours where they hit, you know, Seoul, Tokyo, Taipei, Shanghai, and go across the world, Taipei, they always um, report back as it's one of their favorite cities in the world. So uh, uh, there's a deep desire from Tier 1, um, especially the NBA players we work with, all wanting to appear in Taipei. They, they really like the city. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. The, the food, the culture, the scenery. I mean, if you like hiking and outdoors, uh, it's clean. I mean, there's so many reasons to like uh, Taiwan. And so, like Leif said, I think it's a, it's a prime destination and it should be on a lot of people's radars. Hmm. Okay. Well, that, I mean, I think that's kind of where, you know, you show your value is like saying, hey, these some of these areas where it's uh, overlooked, you guys should, you know, take, point them that way. Let me see. Double check. Okay, so I think we're all set um, in terms of questions. Um, I'd like to just get kind of like one final, you know, your thoughts on everything from all of you guys, and then we'll, we'll actually be done. So, Adam, if you have any final words or anything that you want to say uh, to kind of finish this off, please go ahead. Um, first off, thanks for having me on here. And, mm -hmm. you know, this unique experience to come to Japan, to, you know, to see temples that, you know, were built in 600 things like that to be, you know, engulfed in a culture that has been around for so many centuries. Um, I, I just, I'm glad that I've, I've been able to, fortunate to have such, such a great experience. And, you know, it just shows that when, you, when you're an athlete, you can never take anything for granted. You never know, um, you never know where you're going to end up. And, you know, thanks for the, you know, Japanese, um, Japanese companies, I mean, companies, but the Japanese MPB, the Japanese fans, the culture. Thanks for embracing me, also. So um, it's been a great experience here for the last six months, and hopefully, um, Mr. Donut reaches out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Leif, Leif, we're just gonna go kind of kind of. Yeah, it, you know. Never you for <laughs> it was a, a great honor and to be on the hive, and thank you for moderating. Adam, thank you for being here with us, and I'll see you and buy us a, a nice Kobe State dinner when I'm in Tokyo next. Oh, please. Uh, or, please. Uh, or Osaka. Anyway, great honor on what the Hyde's doing is, is uh, amazing, and uh, I know this is only the beginning, and I, too, would just reiterate that, uh, especially for our Japanese brands that are listening out there, that please take the opportunity while you have such a great baseball player playing every single day in your country here and pretty much every day. So uh, reach out to him directly or reach out to us. We'd be happy to connect. Yep. And David, last one. Yeah. I mean, I'll just echo what both of those guys said. And, and again, thank you, Adam. And, and thank you, Hive, for, for organizing all of this. But um, my last thing would also be to Japanese brands. Um, you know, Japan is an amazing country. Um, American athletes are generally intrigued by this this country they want to see it they want to come here um americans in general are really excited about japan and i think there's a huge opportunity to build this bridge further specifically in sports marketing um and sports marketing is a great way to to get more customers and to get more clients and there's proven roi behind it so i would just encourage more brands to seek out opportunities to to work with people like adam and, and you know other athletes out there Okay, well, thanks guys for coming on. I know it was a little, well, it was early for, for you, Adam, and a little bit late for you guys. Um, you know, so thank you so much for coming on, and I think we're done for today. All right, thank you. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. All right, bye bye. Take care.